Good morning everybody and welcome to the next instalment of OESC in Exile and today we're going to conclude our studies in Titus. So I'm going to read the passage from Titus chapter 3 from verse 9. But avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law because these are unprofitable and useless. Warn a divisive person once and then warn them a second time. After that have nothing to do with them. You may be sure that such people are warped and sinful. They are self-condemned. As soon as I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis, because I have decided to winter there. Do everything you can to help Zenus, the lawyer, and Apollos on their way, and see that they have everything they need. Our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order to provide for urgent needs and not live unproductive lives. Everyone with me sends you greetings. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. On Wednesday at the Bible study, we looked at the seventh of the eight Beatitudes. Blessed are the peacemakers. This morning we are looking at the opposite end of the spectrum, divisive people. Last Sunday we looked at the things Paul was telling Titus to stress. This Sunday we are looking at the things and people Paul was telling Titus to shun. Titus was to stress the Cretans' spiritual journey. He was to remind them what they once were, rebels against God, slaves to self-centred living. He was to remind them what by grace they had become, saved from God's righteous judgment, heirs to eternal life. He was to remind them what they must be in this world, model citizens, neighbourly and productive in the community. Paul now turns his attention to potential problem areas in the churches scattered across Greek, uh, Crete, which had fallen under the spell of false teaching. As Titus went from church to church on Crete, appointing suitable men to be elders, he would likely encounter two hazards. Firstly, people who were propagating unprofitable controversies, and secondly, unprofitable people causing trouble. Often it would be the same people who were pushing the controversies in verse 9, and whom Paul described as divisive in verse 10. How was Titus to tackle these perennial dangers to the health of the local church? Well, Titus, uh, Paul gives Titus clear instructions. Paul leaves Titus no room for misunderstanding what he should do. I'd like to look at this final passage from Titus then under three headings. Firstly, what should Titus do with something distracting? Verse 9. But avoid foolish controversies, genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law, because they are unprofitable and useless. Titus should avoid anything that distracted him in his work of a minister of the gospel. He should give a wide berth from anything that took his attention away from teaching sound doctrine and sound living. He should keep the main thing the main thing. Paul identified three distractions from the main thing that is declaring the truth that leads to godliness. These distractions were foolish controversies, idle speculation about genealogies, and unproductive arguments over the law of Moses. Now some discussion about controversies was necessary, of course. After all, Titus's brief was to appoint spiritually mature elders who would be in a position to teach sound doctrine and refute those who opposed it. What Titus was to avoid like the plague was engaging in foolish controversies. The Greek word translated as foolish is moros, from which we derive the word moron in English. Such controversies then were moronic. Titus was not to go near them. He shouldn't touch them with a barge pole. And critically, he was not to indulge the one spouting them. The shadow of the circumcision group was hanging over the Cretan churches. 
these controversies and quarrels had the false teachers fingerprints all over them. They were pushing a so-called deluxe version of Christianity with a strong emphasis on Jewishness. Now it was important for a devout Jew to be clear about his family line. It was important that he could trace back his genealogy back to Abraham and the patriarchs. The fact that Matthew and Luke each recalled the genealogy of Jesus is significant. Matthew records Jesus's family line back to Abraham to highlight his Jewishness and his descent from the line of David. Luke records fam Jesus's family line back to Adam to emphasize his humanity. But now the grace of God had appeared that offered salvation to all people. That is all types of people, Jew and Gentile, male and female, slave and free. It no longer had any value in God's sight if you could prove your family line was racially Jewish. Likewise with the law of Moses, those of the circumcision group were pressurizing the Cretan converts to adopt Jewish customs and ceremonies. You want to be a really elite kind of Christian? Become a Jew therefore, after all Jesus was a Jew. But again observing the Jewish ceremonial law had no value whatsoever for these Gentile converts to Christ. Jesus' death had fulfilled the requirements of the ceremonial law. In the words of John the Baptist, catching sight of Jesus coming towards him, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. There was of course the obligation to keep the moral law of Moses, but the ceremonial law had no relevance for these Cretan Christians. It held no significance for Titus, also a Greek-speaking Gentile. So Titus was not to allow himself to be dragged into unprofitable and time-consuming arguments. They would yield nothing. Some Christians do love to debate theological issues. I count myself as one of them. Christians can have particular hobby horses, particular pet subjects they could talk endlessly about. After three and a half years at Oxford, you've probably picked up some of mine. However, the fact that someone likes talking a lot about the Christian faith and uses the right language doesn't mean he or she is spiritually mature or is even saved for that matter. They just like talking about matters of faith. There is no virtue in being a religious talking shop. After all, it's much easier to discuss religious theory than to be caring and considerate at home, to be honest and diligent in the workplace and to be public spirited and neighborly in the community. It's a bit like the armchair football fan who never fails to score in the penalty shootout when highly paid professionals do fail. The armchair critic always talks a good game. Talk is cheap, however. But in the words of Shakespeare from Othello, it's mere prattle without practice. One commentator makes this astute observation. The discussion which does not end in action is very largely wasted time. Of course, just as in Titus's time on Crete, some rigorous discussion over controversies is always necessary. In June, the Bishop of Liverpool, Paul Bayes, gave a speech at the conference of the movement of supporting Anglicans for an inclusive church. It was a speech rather than a sermon as he didn't refer once to the Bible. And using a soundbite of the World Council of Churches, let the world set the agenda. The bishop spoke out in favour of the Church of England recognising marriage between people of the same sex and allowing such ceremonies in church. In his 68th year and nearing retirement, he wanted to see these changes to be implemented, implemented during his lifetime. He is the most senior figure in the Church of England to explicitly back this radical change in church law and teaching. But his controversial speech went way beyond the official position of the Church of England. How are conservative evangelicals in the Anglican Church to react to such a statement? Of course they have to contest it. Of course they have to engage in controversy. They have no choice. The gospel is at stake. 
that there are foolish controversies today we would do well to avoid. Here is a flavour of foolish controversies that have distracted churches in the past. Should the church have on display a Christmas tree? Should musical instruments other than the organ or the piano be played in church? What type of piano should the church buy, a grand or an upright one? Should we sing hymns written only before a certain date or only after a certain date? Should we allow versions of the Bible other than the King James Version to be read publicly in church? Should the use of PowerPoint be allowed in the services? Should we hold a carol service at Christmas? These are the sort of issues that can cause some Christians to get hot under the collar about. They can be debated endlessly at church meetings. People retreat into entrenched positions and don't yield an inch. But at the end of the day, they are foolish controversies. They take up the bandwidth which should be given over to discussing what really matters. How best can we reach the neighbourhood with the gospel? What should Titus do with something distracting? Run a mile from it. Something distracting. What secondly should Titus do with someone disruptive? Verse 10. Warn a divisive person once and then warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with them. I used to love watching Kevin Peterson bat. The audacious stroke play, the soaring sixes into the crowd and the swashbuckling devil may care style of play. But in 2014, he was effectively sacked as an England player when he was informed he would not be selected due to a breakdown of trust. A former chairman of the England cricket board described him as an absolute maverick, not a team player. And that was that. Despite his talent, he never played for England again. His presence on and off the field was considered too disruptive for the good of the team. This is the type of person Paul is thinking of here. He or she is disruptive. They poison the atmosphere in the church. They shipwreck the unity of the church. They are divisive. There are three things to bear in mind when with somebody disruptive in the local church. Firstly, consider their motives. It might be pride. They know best. They are a direct descendant of Solomon. They have inherited his genes. They are the fount of all wisdom. They are the self-appointed guardians of the truth. They may have taken a position which contradicts the statement of faith of the church, but who cares? They have a right to express their view. The leaders, by contrast, know nothing. They are the spiritual dummies. So a divisive person may have pride as a motive. But it might be malice, pure malice. They want to do harm. They want to damage the church. They relish being contentious. They love to fight. They love to score points. In fact, sadly, they want to hurt people. It might be just one person. They've taken a dislike to the pastor or one of the leaders. They want to discredit him. They want to pour mud over his reputation. Lastly, a divisive person uses controversy as a cover to hide sin. There is secret sin in their lives. Perhaps somebody else in the church has stumbled across it and challenged them on it. They've been rumbled. Therefore, causing disruption and division in the church is a method of creating a spoke smoke screen to conceal their sin. It's getting in their retaliation in first before they are discovered for what they really are when the truth comes to light. Paul gives the strategy for dealing with someone disruptive. Paul gives Titus crystal clear instructions on how to deal with the divisive person. They are simple and straightforward. There is no need to consult the church minister's handbook of best pastoral practice. Firstly, it is to issue a formal warning. If the guilty person shows signs of repentance, leave it at that. If the same person starts causing division again, warn them a second time formally. If they persist, excommunicate them. 
This does not contradict Jesus' strategy for dealing with sin in the church as set out in Matthew 19. Jesus also speaks of two formal warnings. The first intervention is not formal. It's just a private word between the wronged, the wronged one and the offender. So Paul has a coherent, coherent strategy in dealing with someone divisive. Lastly, we have in verse 11 the verdict on someone divisive. You may be sure that someone, that such people are warped and sinful, they are self-condemned. Paul doesn't spare the divisive person his or her blushes. They may try to give the air of spirituality, but underneath they are sinful and are a slave to their egos. They are warped in the sense that their priorities are all wrong. They're not gospel focused. Instead, they are focused on building up a following for themselves and doing as much damage as they can to those who stand up to them. Interestingly, the word translated as, as divisive is the Greek word hieratikos. It appears just once here in Titus as an adjective. It's where we get our word in English heretic from. What the heretics do? Well, they deny the faith once for all delivered to the saints. Sadly, they sign their own papers of excommunication from the faithful local church. They are self-condemned. Discipline in the local church is very important. Failure to exercise church discipline only serves to push a problem further down the line. It's always best to act early and uh, to speak to the divisive person. Perhaps an informal one-to-one -one conversation with the offender might be enough to stem the problem before their behaviour degenerates and gets out of control. The offender is repentant. He or she realises their sin. They're willing to listen, to receive correction from God's word and to respond positively to it. What should you do when you hear someone grumbling in the church or running down one of the leaders of the church? Tim Chester gives a brilliant piece of advice. He writes, be a buffer and not a channel to the grumbling and gossip. Like a buffer stops the train at the end of the track careering on, out of control with an inevitable crash, a certainty, stop the complaints in their tracks. Bounce the grumbling back to the source. If they're complaining about a leader, tell them to take it up with the person concerned and not to criticise him behind his back. Be a buffer and don't allow yourself to be a channel of the carping. If you do become a channel, it makes the offender feel that they are justified in what they're doing. They sense they have a sympathetic listener giving credence to their grumbles. Some time ago, a few church members were unhappy at the church Elaine and I were members of. They began muttering about the pastor behind his back. It was unkind. It was unjustified. It was unchristian. He got wind of it. Naturally, it hurt him. He was in his first pastorate and it affected his confidence. He left after only serving a few years in the church. It was desperately sad. How Paul's advice then to Titus of 2,000 years ago is right on the money. Something distracting, someone disruptive, and finally verse 14, something to be devoted to. How people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order to provide for urgent needs and not live unproductive lives. Paul doesn't end his letter on a negative note but on a positive one. Before he signs off and dispatches his letter to Titus, he returns to one of the big themes of the epistle, productive Christianity. It was back on the last Sunday of April that we began this series in Titus. I entitled the series, A Call for a Productive Christianity. A prospective elder must be one who loves what is good. The older women in church are to teach what is good to the younger women. Titus is to be a model of good works to the younger men in church. The distinguishing marks of God's own very people are holiness and a zeal for good works. 
The Cretan Christians are to be model citizens of, uh, of their island, ready for every good work. And here again in verse 14, Paul cannot help himself. He comes back once more to the necessity of the Cretan Christians living out and expressing their Christianity through good works. James's blunt words come to mind. But some of them will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I sh will show you my faith by my deeds. Those words Paul uses, our people must learn to devote themselves, caught my eye. In the context of the letter, he was speaking of people who had received Christ only relatively recently. They were largely untaught and unschooled in Christian living. They had a lot to learn. Therefore, they had to begin to learn. The danger for those of us who have been Christians for most of our lifetime is that we think mistakenly there is nothing new to learn. We've been listening to sermons for decades. We've heard it all before. And of course, that is probably true. As we thought about last week, Christian teachers have a reminding ministry as much as they have a teaching ministry. But if we have the attitude, we have nothing new to learn as Christians, we will stagnate. We will grow stale in our faith. We will lose our zeal. However, if we have the mindset we want to be continually learning, learning new ways to be productive as Christians, learning what pleases God, and learning to be on the lookout to do good, we will keep our spiritual vitality and freshness. We won't grow stale. We will maintain our desire to please the Lord Jesus and to honour his name. Paul also writes of learning devotion. To devote ourselves to a cause or a goal means making choices. It means saying no to some things. It means a degree of single-mindedness. It means a setting of priorities to enable that devotion to take place. I don't know if you saw Laura Muir run the race of her life to win the silver medal in the 1500 metres at the Olympics. It brought a tear to my eye. She had experienced so many near misses in the past, with no medal to show for all her efforts. Immediately after the race, she gave an interview. She was obviously thrilled. She said she had worked so hard for so long. It had meant making many sacrifices. But now she'd run her personal best time and had won this silver medal. She had the satisfaction that she could not have done more. That is a very powerful picture of what it is to be devoted. This is the type of devotion Paul was calling the Cretan Christians to, to a devotion to productive Christian living, a devotion to good works. He didn't have an Olympic medal at the end of the line, but it would make the teaching of God our Saviour attractive to outsiders. It would bring honour to the name of Christ. It would be evidence of their, and by extension, our salvation, but not the basis of it. So truly productive Christian lives require devotion. Thus, Paul concludes his letter. He warns Titus to avoid something distracting, foolish controversies. He advises Titus how to deal with someone disruptive and gives him a very clear strategy. He urges Cretan Christians to embrace something to be devoted to productive Christian living expressed by good works. At the beginning of his letter, he wished God's grace and peace upon Titus. At the end of the letter, he does the same. Grace be with you all. For Paul, it all started and ended with grace. A pastor was once quizzed. Why do you preach so much on grace? After all, there are many other things to preach on. Our obligations, our relationships, and our personal character as Christians. The pastor simply replied, because there is nothing else to preach on. As we end our studies in Titus, let's praise and thank God again for his grace that has appeared and has offered salvation to all people, even the likes of us. Amen.